What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Hicker Scuba and Marina. If you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor. Hit this little subscribe button over here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys are going to be notified every time we upload new content. And we got a brand new film series coming out today where we're going to be looking at and reviewing the SSI Science of Diving Program. Now this is one of my favorite classes to teach for several different reasons. One, this is an academic only program, which means all there is to it is simply classroom. Now, you don't even have to see an instructor to take this course. You can do the online portion alone, take your final exam and get a certification. Yes, this is a full-on certification class. This is a specialty program, so this will apply towards your advanced open water and even your master diver rating. And this class is even a prerequisite to all professional level programs in the SSI curriculum. Now, the great thing is you don't even have to be an SSI diver to take this program, but this program is going to apply to all divers. This is kind of a collaboration of many different programs put together. So we're going to be looking at physics, physiology, we're even going to be talking about some ecology throughout this program, and we're even going to be talking about equipment mechanics as well. So if there's certain things that you want to understand about how certain types of dive equipment work, this is going to be the class for you as well because it's going to kind of like I said, it's a collaboration of all these classes put together. So with that being said, let's jump into chapter one of the SSI Science of Diving program. So the first part of chapter one that we're going to look at, of course, is physics. And the primary thing that we need to understand about physics is pressure and how pressure affects us and our equipment. There's really three stages of pressure that you really need to understand. The first is atmospheric pressure. That's here at the surface. That's basically 14.7 pounds per square inch. The next pressure that we're going to look at, of course, is gauge pressure. Now, another way to think of gauge pressure is simply hydrostatic pressure or water pressure. That's going to be whatever pressure you are when you're underwater. And then, of course, we have have total pressure. This is where we add the constant atmospheric pressure here at the surface to whatever gauge pressure we are at depth, and it's going to give us a total atmospheric pressure. And we're going to use this all throughout our diving career, whether we're calculating lift theory or calculating how much gas we need, or more importantly, how much gas we're going to be breathing at depth. Understanding the difference between atmospheric pressure, gauge pressure, and total pressure is going to be very important to you as a diver. Now, the next part of chapter one that we're going to look at, it really kind of plays into what we just learned about the different pressures. And if we think of a dive cylinder here for a second, I got a question for you. When is a dive cylinder going to be empty? Is it going to be on zero, zero PSI? What is that zero PSI actually telling us? Well, that's just simply put, that is the gauge pressure of the cylinder. That is not going to be the total atmospheric pressure of what's inside the cylinder. You see, there's another type of pressure that we're going to learn about. And of course, that is ambient or equal pressure. And this ambient pressure is very similar to what total atmospheric pressure is as well. If I took a dive cylinder and I put it on zero PSI, theoretically, I should be able to unscrew the valve. Well, in reality, there's still 14.7 pounds per square inch inside that cylinder, even if your gauge is reading zero, because we have 14.7 pounds per square inch of the atmosphere, and that's going to be equal to what's in the cylinder. So really, if your cylinder is at 14.7 pounds per square inch, you can unscrew the valve even if your gauge does not read zero. So the next thing that we're going to talk about in chapter one, of course, is temperature. And there's two ways to measure temperature. Whether you like the Imperial and you simply use Fahrenheit, or you like the metric system and we use Celsius, it's really going to be up to you how you calculate it. But it's very important that we understand what happens when we change the temperature of something. For every one degree temperature change, you're going to have anywhere between five to 10 PSI differential, if you will. So if your temperature goes up, your pressure is going to increase. If your temperature drops, your pressure is going to drop. Now, this really comes into play when you fill a scuba cylinder. If we filled your scuba cylinders to say 3000 PSI and it was at say room temperature and then you jumped into a cold water environment, that pressure is going to immediately drop. So whenever you check your gauges on the surface, you may want to recheck them when you get underwater to understand exactly how much pressure you have when that tank cools off because of the water. Now, the next part of chapter one that we're going to talk about, of course, is pressure and volume and the difference between the two. A lot of times divers really just focus on the pressure, whether you're talking about, say, the imperial system where we talk about PSI or we're talking about the metric system where we talk about bar. But we really need to understand there is a differential between pressure and volume. When we talk about volume, we're either going to be looking at cubic footage, which means, hey, I got an 80 cubic foot tank, or we're going to be talking about liters. I have an 11 liter tank. Now, there is a huge 
huge difference when we talk about pressure and volume in general, and you need to understand how to calculate the volume of a cylinder based off its pressure. If I said your cylinder had 3000 PSI or 200 bar in it, you would say, well, my cylinder is completely full. Well, that's for a, say, 80 cubic foot or 11 or 12 liter cylinder. If you go up to a high pressure cylinder, say a 100 cubic foot tank, that cylinder may be rated at 3442 PSI or 3500 PSI. So now if we put 3000 PSI in it, it's not going to be, say, the full 100 cubic feet. So you need to understand how to calculate how much cubic foot is actually in your cylinder when we base it off pressure alone. And your SSI Science of Diamond Instructor is going to go over these calculations with you, and this is going to help you, especially if you take, say, the SSI Deep Diver program, because by being able to calculate the exact cubic footage of a cylinder, you're going to help when we talk about planning through your RMV and your SAC rate as well of what size cylinder you need based off the depth you're going to and how long you're staying. Now the next part of chapter one that we're going to be talking about is measuring length. Now whether you're measuring say for the metric system or the imperial system, it's going to be very important that you understand the differences in length when we deal with both freshwater and saltwater because it's very important when you're doing calculations to use the right implementation. Simply put, if you are using the imperial system, you are going to use 34 feet as a increment, if you will, for your measurements than what you will in saltwater where we're using 33 feet. Now you can fix this issue by simply just calculating everything in the metric system and just using 10 meters. However, it's still not going to be exactly accurate if you want that exact science. So a lot of people will choose the imperial system here just because we can differentiate between say freshwater and saltwater or 34 feet increments versus say 33 feet increments. So the next part of chapter one that we're going to be talking about, of course, is density. And there's several different things that we can talk about here. One, we can be talking about the density of the water, whether say it's fresh water or salt water, but we can also be talking about the density of gas. Now, if you continue on into the XR programs from SSI, your instructor is going to talk about the breathing density of certain gases and why we need to breathe certain gases at certain depth. But your SSI science of diving instructor is going to show you several different calculations that's going to assist not only in, say, breathing gas or even weight calculations but he's also going to go over say lift theory. Maybe you're getting into the search and recovery program and you need to understand lift theory based off the density of the water as well. Alright guys, as we continue on in chapter one, we're going to be talking about several different gases. Now in the SSI open water diver program, you really learn about two different breathing mixes. One is standard air, that's 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. The next gas that you learned about, or breathing gas, was enriched air nitrox. This is basically where we increase the partial pressure of O2 anywhere between say 22% and 40%, which would be recreational nitrox. Now there's actually a third gas that sometimes we talk, we breathe, that of course is tri-mix and you will learn about this in the extended range programs but in short we're simply adding helium to the mix as well this is going to help with the breathing density of the gas it's also going to help eliminate say nitrogen narcosis at depth and it's also going to help eliminate too much own gassing of say nitrogen throughout your dive but there's also two bad gases that we need to worry about both carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide can affect divers very quickly at depth. And your SSI Science of Diving instructor is actually going to go over some of the bad things that can happen if you breathe too much of this gas or too much higher partial pressures of this gas. Now, if you want to learn a good course that helps, say, eliminate that, check out the Diver Stress and Rescue program or the SSI React Right program, which is going to teach you how to properly react to, say, a diver that has too much carbon dioxide buildup or a diver who's suffering, say, from carbon monoxide poisoning. So the next part of chapter one that we're going to be talking about is the five basic laws in physics. And this is something that you actually learn in your open water program, but it might not have been explained in great detail. We are going to start, of course, with Boyle's law. Boyle's law deals with two things, pressure and volume. Pressure and volume are actually inversely related. If we increase pressure, then of course, volume is going to decrease. The next thing that we're going to talk about, of course, is Dalton's law. Dalton's law deals with the partial pressure of a given gas, such as say standard breathing gas. We understand that standard breathing gas is 21% oxygen to 79% nitrogen. If you add the two together, you get 100%. So Dalton's law is going to deal with those individual partial pressures. Now, when we talk about Henry's law, Henry's law is going to talk about the absorption of those gases, whether it's oxygen or nitrogen. Now, in short, oxygen is a metabolized gas. That means our body uses it. Toward nitrogen, we do nothing with it. It's an inert gas. However, thanks to Boyle's law, as we increase pressure, as we go down, the decrease of, say, the volume 
volume of that nitrogen bubble, eventually your body is going to absorb it into its tissue. This is when we get into, say, decompression theory. Now, the next one that we're going to talk about, of course, is Gay-Lussac or Charles's Law. This is where we look at the relationship between temperature and, of course, pressure as well. If we increase temperature, the pressure will increase. If we decrease temperature, the pressure will decrease. And then, of course, the last one that we're going to talking about is Archimedes principle. This is where we get into lift theory. Now in your open water program you learned about positive buoyancy, negative buoyancy, and neutral buoyancy, but we're actually going to show you how to calculate the right amount of weight to get the right buoyant that you need, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral, and we're really going to go into depth of how you can calculate this at any given depth as well. Now at the beginning of chapter one, I talked a little bit about, say, the breathing density of gas, and I talked about certain calculations when we're talking about SAC rates and RMV rates. Well, in chapter one, or towards the end of chapter one, you're actually going to learn how to calculate a SAC rate, both in the metric and the imperial system, and we're also going to learn how to calculate the RMV rate as well. Now, if you don't know the difference, SAC rate is nothing more than your surface air consumption. How much gas do you breathe here at the surface in a given amount of time? And then, of course, RMV stands for respiratory minute volume. Now, we did a complete breakdown video of how to calculate SAC and RMV and which one's actually more important. I'll link that video down below for you and throw it up top as well if you want to go check out that video. But understanding how to calculate your SAC and RMV is going to be very important when you plan dives. It's also going to help you understand how long a cylinder is physically going to last given whatever depth you're going to. So the last part of chapter one, your SSI science of diving instructor is going to go over light and sound and how both are affected when you descend below the surface. Now with light, there's really three things that we focus on. Reflection, refraction, and absorption. Basically in short, light's going to bounce off the water. It's going to come back to the top. That is called reflection. We're also going to have what's called light refraction. This is where the light breaks as it descends through the median of water. This is going to cause things to appear larger than what they are. It's also going to make things appear like it's actually closer to you. And then of course the last is absorption. Light actually gets absorbed based off the turbidity or the suspended particles in the water column. And obviously the deeper we go we're going to start losing light because of that absorption rate. This is where we get all the different color changes and this is why it's important to always dive with some type of dive light. Even if you're not night diving, take a light with you, especially if you're doing underwater photography. Simply put, you want to see real colors when you're underwater. So simply by taking a light we can add that light back to whatever it is we're looking at and we can get better quality photos. Now if you're interested in a good class on photography, check out the SSI photo and video class. This is a great class to teach you how to set up cameras, what cameras and filters you need at certain depths, and it's even going to go over certain editing techniques to teach you how to get the best quality photos if you want to get into that type of diving. All right, guys, so that's going to do it for chapter one in this series on the SSI Science of Diving program. We really hope this video makes it easier for you to understand certain things as a diver. We hope it makes you grow as a diver, makes you feel more safe and comfortable and even confident when you're underwater. But definitely stay tuned. In chapter two, we're going to be talking about physiology and what physically happens to your body. But if this video did help, give me a big thumbs up. If you got any questions, comments, or concerns, drop me a comment down below, and I'll try my best to answer your questions as best as I can and as quick as I can as well. But until chapter two, take care, God bless, and I'll see you in the next one.